This video will explain a surprising paper from DeepMind titled Multimodal Few Shot Learning with Frozen Language Models. Before getting into any of the details, the high level overview of the study can be summarized pretty quickly. The idea is to take a frozen pre trained language model, like something like GPT 3, where it's been trained on a large amount of text, say, you know, all of Wikipedia, Books Corpus, all of Reddit, these web scrapes for text data, it's been trained on masking out the token at the end of the sequence on a massive amount of text data, and then you freeze the parameters in that language model, and you add vision embeddings to that input sequence, and then task it with these multimodal vision language tasks, particularly uh, visual question answering, or few shot image classification, given a new description of the object, the DAX, Blicky that we'll describe later, and then also image captioning is how it's trained. So we get more into the details of how exactly this works, but the high level overview is that you freeze the parameters of the pre-trained language model, hence the name frozen. Uh, you take images, you encode them with a the vision encoder, map them to, in this case, two tokens. So the vision encoder has that uh, vector representation and then funnels it into two tokens to append to the uh, representation. And then this is for each of the input images, you could have alternate alternating images as shown in this picture and this picture, or you could just have something like this where you have a car, what color is the car and these kinds of uh, questions. So these are the kinds of tasks, visual question answering and these, this few shot image classification. And then we'll dive more into the details of how they train this vision encoder, the conceptual captions data set that they use, and then more particularly the evaluation of few shot learning, comparing uh, few shot learning when they're using it to describe GPT-3 or this model compared to say model agnostic meta learning, the metadata set, this other kind of par paradigm of learning to learn quickly with this setting of having the, these meta training data sets and so on. So here's how the frozen model is trained. You freeze the parameters of the language model, meaning that they're not updated during the training, but the gradients get prop back propagated into the vision encoder. So the vision encoder takes in the image and then maps it into the vector representation, but then goes into these two token slots to the language model. So I'm not sure exactly how this works. It has something to do with, uh, say, each of the uh, dimensionality of the token embeddings as each of the embeddings of a token in a language model's vocabulary, say, has a dimension of 512 as a typical vector length. So we put two 512 dimensional vectors to represent this image of a red boat. So you have the data set is conceptual caption. So this is three million uh, image text pairs of image captioning. So the task is to write the natural language description that corresponds with the image, like this one, a small red boat on the water. And then one of the de detail of this is that they're hypernimmed, meaning that there aren't any named entities in the data set. So if there was a celebrity picture, they would change that into man or woman. And if there's something like a branded anything, they would change that into a bottle or whatever the branded thing was. So there are no named entities in this conceptual captions data set, which is why when they later on text, test this uh, external knowledge retrieval thing, it's even more interesting because it has to be getting this from the frozen language model. It can't possibly have learned it in the pre-training task. And then the last detail that might be interesting is that uh, they can't fine tune the language model, they say, because there isn't enough of this paired data. They have 3 million pairs. So actually fine tuning the language model would decrease the performance of the language model compared to the massive amount of data it was pre-trained with through language modeling. So to back up a little bit, this research is inspired by the success of prompting. Prompting shown here in the GBT3 paper is where you add this uh, context to the input to help it guide the generation. So uh, this isn't exactly an example of prompting. This is where you have the title, uh, subtitle article, and you're tasking the model to write an article. So prompting generally refers to adding the additional things in the input to try to guide the language model's generation. And now we're seeing a multimodal language model with this kind of prompting strategy, where we're prompting the frozen language model, adding it to the input with these images. And I highly recommend uh, testing out prompting for yourself in the, in the text on the interface using this link to access the GPT Neo 6 billion parameter model. The first task tested is rapid tab ta adaptation. From the pre-training of the conceptual captions data set where you write something like a small red boat on the water down into visual question answering like how many boats are on the water, what color is the boat, or what the boat, what is the boat sitting on, ideas like that. So this is the uh, zero shot, one shot, and four shot transfer from the frozen model into visual question answering. So this is an example of task transfer in a different kind of image language task from captioning to visual question answering. And this n equals zero, n equals one, n equals four, going back to the idea of prompting, that's how many examples of the task you're gonna show in the input. So uh, say you're asking it, uh, what fruit is this? Apple being the answer, and you add to the input, what fruit is this? Orange, what fruit is this? Banana. These kind of demonstrations are what they mean by uh, four shot in the context of these uh, prompts. 
The visual question answering capability is really impressive, but the encyclopedic knowledge results are really what, in my opinion, jumps off the page with this experiment. The encyclopedic knowledge is describing being able to retrieve factual information from the frozen language model guided by the image and maybe some examples in the context as well to help guide uh, the generation but you could just have the input of the airplane and this was invented by and still test out this is the idea of prompting and then prompt tuning would be the idea of trying to find the perfect image uh, caption pairs that help with uh, the, the knowledge retrieval that is being tested at the end so we have these pairs microscope car invented by and then the airplane and it's able to retrieve this knowledge of the wright brothers and again this isn't in the pre-trained uh, data set with the conceptual captions because it's all uh, hypernym so there's no uh, Wright brothers in the pre-training data set in the training of the visual encoder. So the language model is able to see that this is an airplane, some some representation like that from the visual encoder and then map it into the language models, uh, representation space, reasoning capability, these kinds of ideas of how the language model operates and then map it and retrieve the Wright brothers. And here are some more examples uh, using emojis and completing the emojis. And then another example where uh, you have a question, I have this problem, what can I do? Answer, and amazing that it's able to say, if you can remove it, gently rub the scuff with a clean white cloth from the spilled wine glass. So I think this example here is really remarkable, noting that it hasn't been fine-tuned on visual question answering, especially with this. This isn't really how these uh, VQA data sets are usually set up anyways. It's usually would be like how many glasses are in the image or uh, what color is the stain, ideas like that. It's not usually, uh, I have this problem, what can I do about it? And then this open-ended generation answer of how you could remove a wine stain from a carpet. So then the authors are gonna drill deeper into the idea of few shot learning and how it's defined in GPT-3 compared to say model agnostic meta learning and this research on few shot learning with data sets like mini ImageNet and OmniGlot. So generally we have uh, two approaches, two families of approaches that at least I'm aware of. They're kind of the template strategies and the template strategies are pretty similar to the GPT-3 and now this frozen idea where you have this pre-trained representation that you just wanna be able to quickly adapt to a downstream task through something like say uh, conditional batch normalization where you you know guide the parameters with something like an efficient transfer learning with adapter layers, minimum kind of fine tuning to adapt it to where you only say have four examples per class to fine tune it on. Some kind of idea of having this universal template that can just be adapted from the template and that's kind of the idea of GBT3 and Frozen. And the other idea like model agnostic meta learning is to learn how to learn quickly. So you have these great, you have this outer inner loop gradient and then ideally it has some parameter space where it can learn quickly from only four labeled examples. So it's kind of a different idea of uh, learning to learn quickly and having these meta training, meta test sets for how they construct learning tasks in a bit of a more complex way of thinking about the overall scope of this problem. And, you know, I, I don't know, have a comment on whether this will, this kind of research will, how exactly it will mesh with GPT-3, but it's a bigger scope of research of thinking about few shot learning. So here are some definitions about few shot learning provided in the paper. We start off with task induction, and this is as shown with the spilled wine glass example of, please answer this question, or I have a question, what should I do about this? This kind of idea of inferring the task is being applied. This kind of reminds me of the T5 text-to-text -text transfer transformer paper, uh, when I first read that paper, I thought that the way it was doing it was by uh, having natural language descriptions of the task. I'm not sure if they one hot encode the different tasks or whether it really is natural language descriptions, but imagine just having, uh, you unify all these tasks into the text framework. So it would say text classification, you know, colon, and then the input, natural language inference, the inputs, question answering the inputs, that kind of way of, of uh, giving the model the sense of what task it's supposed to uh, perform. Whereas language modeling, there's a paper in the ACL catalog titled uh, something like language modeling is multitask learning because in language modeling, you do have to kind of infer these different tasks in a way, in the way that this mass prompt requires you to do it in order to you know, complete the correctly masked out token. So the next thing, common thing, this idea of the number of shots, when you say few shot, you're defer, uh, describing how many examples are given. So one shot means you have one example, two shots, three shots, so on. So, so drilling into this further, they define the number of ways, which are the number of object classes in the, in the task. So say CIFAR 10 would have 10 ways, 10 object classes for classification. Number of inner shots is again, this idea of shots, but maybe more uh, specific to the inner category when you're uh, sampling the shots for, so the, I think what this means is that the overall scope of this could have 10 ways, so 10 classes, and then it only sees uh, three shots, so dog, cat, airplane, or some idea like that is what I think they're trying to communicate with the dis distinction between the overall cardinality of possible class labels and then what's seen in the few shot uh, demonstration context. And then the number of repeats, 
seems to be how many times you repeat the same class. So how many dogs, how many cats, this kind of idea of further breaking down the uh, distributions and the inputs for few shot learning. And I'm not exactly sure if that's uh, what they mean by this, but at least that's how I interpreted it and hopefully that's useful for you. So next up, we're testing this idea of visual concept binding and constructing a new data set titled open-ended mini ImageNet. So the way this works is we're generating a two-way question with n inner shots. So to further, uh, here's the illustration of the idea. n inner shots means, for this case, two lions, two dogs. And then the fast concept binding means we're going to reassign lion to be Blicket and the wolf is Dax. So this is the template for constructing the data set. You select two classes, so say lion, wolf, from the S, which is the number of object categories. Sample, in this case, two images of the lion, two images of the wolf and then you interleave the sequence. So you have uh, wolf, lion, wolf, lion, wolf. Then you reassign the lion, wolf to nonsense words, Dax, Blicket, uh, at random with respect to which one you sampled. Then you uh, sample the question image. So you append the prompt, this is a, uh, and then the nonsense word. And then you have as the inference, uh, the truncated caption, this is a, uh, to the uh, VQ, uh, VQ is the question template, so just question colon or however you want to ask the question. This is here, I have a question for you, whatever you can imagine as a natural language description of the question. And that's used to form this mini image net data set. And you could have many ways of sampling, you, you can sample a thousand different of these prompts given the data set, where as input you have the set of images and then the uh, object classes. This paper is presenting a really interesting idea that language is a good interface for combining other modalities in this multimodal learning and that the language layer may be the most important layer in these multimodal representations. And it seems, it seems to make sense because the language models are trained on so much knowledge intensive data that it's really different from most of these other tasks. Images or uh, videos, maybe videos, but audio, these kinds of data sets, I don't think they convey as much information as these you know, like hundreds of gigabytes of text data scraped from Wikipedia books and all these ideas that will describe these visual concepts somewhere in them. And maybe they just need a little bit of grounding from the visual encoder, audio encoder, video encoder, as shown in this data set or other modalities we can imagine like uh, touch as you have this encoding of say robot sensors or LIDAR sensors or all these different other kind of ideas. So I think it's interesting thing about language is the interface of these other modalities. And clearly this experiment has shown that this strategy works to some degree. And they do note that this isn't the state of the art for visual question answering or any of these other vision language tasks. But the fact that this works at all, I think is pretty remarkable. Thank you so much for watching this quick overview of multimodal few shot learning with frozen language models. One of the most interesting papers that have come out recently with a really surprising result of being able to freeze the language model, train a vision encoder, and then perform these few shot learning tasks with visual inputs where it does things like uh, adaptation from captioning to visual question answering, uh, this encyclopedic knowledge retention, and then this idea of uh, quickly, I don't, this is not shown in this image, but this idea of quickly being able to bind new concepts, like reassigning lion to Dax or Blicket, and then asking questions, what is this lot, what is this image of a lion? And then the text answer, it's a Dax now, because we've reassigned it in this open-ended mini image net data set. So thanks for watching. Please stay tuned for the rest of the AI Weekly Update series, and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.